we're going to do something a little bit weird here. We're going to clean off the ring right off the bat so that we can try to finish the tournament before it's over. And as we get that glued up, we'll start with some introductions. Nothing better in the world than some tight on and glue. You need to be too careful with it. It's not like you're making fine furniture at this point because you're going to turn most of the stuff away. Kind of spread it out a little bit. All right, and we can't see that on the camera. Okay, we're going to come in with a little nice piece of uh, silicone since it's somebody else's lathe, not mine, and a kind of a cheapy cone center you made yourself with an old uh, uh, live center. Come in and get that ready to go. And with this fairly modest pressure, line this thing up. Kind of check to see that the center, and really just by eyeball, kind of split the difference between those joints so that you've kind of centered it there and just modest pressure. Now, if you look, we have about an inch wide glue joint there. It's got lots of strength and it will be strong enough to turn in between 30 minutes or so. So, we're going to start with the rest of the presentation and let that sit for a few minutes. Well, I'm Dan Swain, and uh, this is my first time ever presenting uh, to the club. I've only been turning about four years. And uh, so I thought I should set myself a rather modest set of expectations. So, uh, and usually if you keep things in threes, you can't go wrong because you can count them off on your fingers there. So my first objective would be to not injure anyone in the audience. Secondly, not to make a complete fool of myself. And then third, maybe get through at least half of the presentation and we'll call it a success for that. So if you set modest expectations, you're always able to uh, meet them. And that's, uh, that's where we're at tonight. We're going to come in and take a, a look at this, and uh, um, we're going to give just a little extra to all of this. I don't normally bother with that, but for this we will. Uh, segmenting turning is actually pretty easy. You rip some boards into lengths, you cut the angles there, you glue some rings together, you stack those up, and then you turn the bolt. And there really aren't any specific, really difficult turning activities that you have to do. And so I kind of think of it as kind of an easier way to do some turning. However, when you stop and talk to people about segmented turning, the first thing that I always talk about how precise it is, how detailed, uh, how time consuming it must be, and uh, uh, things of that nature, kind of uh, really, boy, this must be difficult. And so I want to talk about kind of both safety and efficiency tonight that one, much simpler if you have a few tricks of the trade that you can deploy here, and it's faster and easier than you may, uh, may think. We're also, and I think largely, although uh, certainly the, the, uh, the folks are absolute experts at it, but I think with uh, Dale Nish's uh, book uh, about uh, Ray, uh, um, Ray, Allen. Ray Allen's segmented turning, there's so much focus on accuracy and the use of this 10 inch sander and sanding all these pieces and stuff like this that it makes it sound difficult. And so I'm going to tell you that don't even worry about the 10 inch sander, plan on never using it, and throw away the digital cap holders. You're not going to need those at all. And so with simply a table saw or a chop saw if you have it and some, some uh, little bit of repeatability is more important than accuracy or precision measurements there. And so that's kind of the theme of the efficiency is how we can do this. I was telling Ron, I probably have about uh, two to four hours in this bowl at this point right now, uh, total. And, uh, and that including starting with strips of wood and wood from there. So why do segmented turning at all? It would be one thing that you would, uh, would ask. And, and for me, it is that you have almost absolute control over the shape of the vessel that you're going to get. And it's fun to work with the uh, pieces of wood like we've got in the auction tonight and so on, that you, the kind of the wood dictates what you wind up with, and as you cut into it, you kind of see the shape take forward. Sometimes you want a specific thing. And so if you're wanting for something specific, you have an idea what to make, the, the segment of turning is ideal for it. Same sort of thing is that wood availability. Uh, we see a uh, cherry board is not very expensive compared to a uh, cherry blank the size to make a bowl like this. This bowl probably has, uh, I'm guessing, uh, apes and maybe $10 worth of wood in it, total. And if you, now if you were lucky to find a piece of cherry this size that wasn't split up, you'd be, that would be pretty good. But to buy a blank is rather expensive for this. 
Uh, this one, uh, again, was uh, uh, I broke my wife's favorite ceramic vase and was forced to make one that matched in color and size. And so here we have a segmented turning about 14 inches in diameter. <coughs> also, there's a big push, or, or if you look on the websites for segmented turning, you see a lot of southwestern design. There's just dozens and dozens of pieces of southwestern design, some better than others in size. But not everything has to be southwestern design. So you can get a pretty nice modern looking piece if you want to. You use, this is black uh, shoe dye or leather dye from the, from the boot shop. On the outside of it, a little bit of a, of a, a Sharpie marker pen, and a nice maple inside with a, kind of a square bottom to it where you can pick up the square pieces and so on. You're still able to see the grain and you get the shape you want and a, a, a nice looking piece uh, and a high gloss uh, finish to it. Same type of thing. <coughs> You can't control the grain very well. We're going to talk about grain a little bit more when we get to the end here. But you can get a very consistent grain pattern. That's what you're looking for. Very lightweight, uh, thin bowl. And uh, again, uh, we'll see some photos when I was making this one. Uh, at uh, a very limited amount of time to put one of these together, especially with the uh, uh, open turning like this. Now, if you want, you also can get uh, some of the segmented, more of the southwestern designs here. We're going to talk a little bit more later on about some of the grain matching stuff that you can do to, uh, to get these going. So, um, you have this control over the, uh, uh, of the shape. You're able to uh, uh, use available woods. You also can experiment with exotic woods that you wouldn't otherwise be able to afford. Uh, it turns out that something like turning red heart is amazing. Just cuts like butter. It smells like perfume when you cut it. Uh, you get a wind, and it's terrible. Splitters are flying everywhere. Like needles coming off of the wood. Uh, purple heart, uh, uh, yellow heart, all the really interesting exotic woods that you can test in small amounts as compared to having to purchase a large amount of wood. So that's kind of the main reasons to get after segmented turning. And just like every other kind of bowl turning that you're going to ever find out to, the prime consideration is always the shape of the bowl. I think in everything you look at in wood turning, the shape and the flow of the curves is the most important piece of it. The craftsmanship particularly stands out in uh, the uh, uh, wood turning that you can't have sloppy joints and stuff like this. And that's going to be pretty easy to actually uh, uh, take care of as we take a look at some of the jigs that you can make for uh, uh, low, low cost there. Of course, the finish of it. And the very last thing that I would tell you to worry about is a feature ring or the exotic little piece that you may or may not want to put across here. The bowls can be very exciting and very nice with just a nice rim, a small piece of veneer down at the bottom to give it a color piece and let the wood speak for itself without needing to necessarily make a very complex, time-consuming uh, feature ring that's got all the details that you may see on it. So let's go ahead and talk about design for a second. I want to start with the efficiency of design. And I would, uh, would tell everyone that it's pretty simple to, uh, to make a quick and fast design that you can, is both constructible when you get done uh, and uh, uh, also has a very nice, uh, nice shape to it. In general, I always use a French curve to lay out any design that I'm going to make. And they come in a variety of shapes here. And the French curve is a continuously varying radius, radius. There's never a circle. There's never a straight line anywhere on the French curve. And so if you simply come in and say, gosh, I kind of want it to be about this tall and open it up like that. And I want a base up like that. And I want it to be about this wide. You can usually come in with a French curve. You'll notice my expensive cardboard French curve I've made specially for this presentation. And you can usually kind of adjust a fit right into something like this and it'll come out pretty close to all those things. And then you just come in, make a, make, make a nice uh, curve here. And you'll find a lot of stuff about making full-size drawings and, and so on. And I would encourage you not to do that. Never bother with anything besides a uh, uh, half-size drawing. A single line drawing, don't worry about wall thickness, and just put it on a piece of graph paper. Once you've got this thing drawn full size on a piece of graph paper, you can kind of come in, figure out that your solid piece of wood for the base needs to be a little bit bigger, so that's a diameter, say, of about five inches on one of these. And then you come through and you decide how to make this, and on all of your segments here, simply come over a quarter inch on the outside, 
and about three quarters of an inch on the inside. On the outside, you need to be have a little bit of room to cut away the wood. And on the inside, which we'll flip over in a second to show, there's a little notch that you've got to worry about. So you take from the outside in, a quarter inch for the thickness you want, a uh, quarter inch for kind of waste, and a little extra inch, eighth of an inch to get rid of some of that spot, and simply make this between five eighths and three quarter, this a quarter all the way through, and you just go all the way down, making it across like that. And so within just a few moments, you can have laid out a bowl and all of the sizes you need. You know the outer radius that you're going to have here, and you know how thick that piece of wood is going to be all off of a single line drawing. So don't worry about the thickness of it. Or have, you know, you assume you're going to use a quarter inch. If you want your bowls half inch, just add some more uh, room to that. But for me, I do all the outside dimensions, one quarter inch blind line, all the inside dimensions, five eighths inside the line. You might give yourself three quarters for a big one. Now, if you have a really steep bowl, really with a very, very flat, I guess the way you put it, you might make that a little bit bigger because as you measure across that angle, it's thinner if you measure straight than if you measure across right at the angle. So that's a little bit. So now you come up and you stack up these rings. In general, I would say to most people will start out, if you make bowls that are between five and eight inches high, or, or vases, uh, and maybe about oh, five to eight inches uh, in diameter, those bowls will be easy to handle on the lathe. They don't take much wood. You don't need to have any uh, 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 steadies to hold the bowl up. Uh, uh, steady as you try to hollow the outside. You can use lightweight tools. And also, that tends to be kind of the size that fits well on shelves and, uh, and seems to be kind of marketable. So you're going through, and you take this all the way up to the top, and you have a series of rings or segments that you're going to put together. My board turned out to be a little bit bigger than uh... And so we come in some, some terminology as you go to use some tables here, some terminology here. You've got these segments that you're going to make all the way around uh, the uh, uh, bowl. And you're going to cut these out on a table saw. We're going to show a jig there for a second here. But you need to know that this is the segment length. And this outside radius is to what they call the apothem of the uh, circle, not the radius, which is out to here. And then inside, this is that little piece I said that you need a little bit of extra room to worry about here. And this is how wide your, uh, your board's going to be. Now, on everything, when you make your drawing, you've got quarter-inch graph paper. Just draw to an eighth of an inch accuracy. Never bother getting less than an eighth of an inch accuracy. And certainly, get, don't get down into the thousands or thirty seconds or something like this. And then when you actually cut these pieces, never worry about less than one sixteenth of an inch. So we're going to start out that all the drawings are done to an eighth of an inch or less or, or more, and all of the segment lengths that you're going to worry about are going to be a sixteenth of an inch or less. So let's take a quick look here at how do you get this figured out. self-minder for every bowl you might awake you might want to make from six segments all the way out to 48 segments around we've got the dimensions calculated out for any bowl you would like to make so if you know for instance that you've got an outer radius of two and five eighths of an inch thick and that's and you uh, and you uh, uh, excuse me two, it's going to be in your board that you're cutting from the width is a is a one and a half inch wide. Using those two numbers, you can come down and say, first of all, you're going to need a board 14 and 5 eighths long. And the reason that's important is if you've ever cut 15 segments and not had enough left for that last segment, it's really disappointing to start with. Okay? And you've wasted all that wood. So if you know how much wood you need, you can plan out your project quite easy. Then for a two and five eighths uh, inch outer radius, my segments need to be 1 and 7 sixteenths long. All I've got to worry about is this dimension is 1 and 7 sixteenths. I set my saw up to make that cut and everything will work out fine. So again, you draw up to an eighth of an inch, 
leaving yourself however much you want either side to cut off, and then uh, 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 use only a sixteenth of an inch for what you're going to cut something. On these tables, you'll notice there are some places here, if you look at these, we'll say like one and four sixteenths. That's because that's the only way that uh, uh, Excel will automatically make these spreadsheets and round them off. And here, uh, uh, again, we've got the links here. One other thing to, to watch out for, this is an exact link, including an eighth of an inch gap for each cut made on the board. So you've got your soft curves planned in, but you have nothing left to hold on to for the last cut, okay? So to be sure, a good two inches there is kind of nice to hold on to uh, when you do that. Now, I sometimes come in and use a worksheet like this where I know, let's say I need, uh, I need eight rings high and a base, and here's the rings numbers one, two, three. This is all laid out. I put a name for it, height, diameter, the number of segments I'm going to use. It's all on one sheet of paper. Uh, and this sheet is also in, your, uh, in the website if you want to look at it. And then lastly, I actually have gone to using this sheet. You can see the bowl we're working on right now. All the data is on here. I call this a trumpet flare. You can see the uh, sketch here uh, where I've come to it. I put it in a little fat down at the bottom so that I can have a little more overlap on that very last piece. And so an entire bowl is now on this one sheet of paper. And you can leave it in the shop. And if you have to take a break, get a phone call, or come back next week, you don't get everything mixed up and make a mistake when you start over. Uh, my uh, my uh, life of woodworking would be correcting mistakes. Uh, you, uh, most of them, uh, nobody else can tell when they're done, but I have uh, never has anything that I've ever built looked like the plan at the end, but it's looked like how I fixed the mistakes. So these sheets are in our website for you to download and use if you want to. The only thing I'll say about this one, it's an 11 by 17, and if you go to like the UPS store to have it printed, it will not print correct um, eight or quarter inch squares. They, they're off every time, and so just assume they're quarter inch squares, and use them in half, and that's an eighth, and you're good to go. Okay, so now we've designed a bowl, whether we had the little curve that I had there beginning, or uh, we've got this uh, trumpet flare bowl over here. The idea that we can one set of calculations, one of these pages, we know how long all these segments have to be. And then, I think, yeah. So then we're gonna, gonna wanna cut these things. And there's a website from a guy named Jerry Bennett called SegEasy. And this is probably the only tool that you need to make in the uh, entire endeavor, if you will, for your, turning your first several bowls. You simply got a slot that slides in your table saw, and uh, you've got these two boards that will move back and forth. And you can purchase a set of what they call wedgies, or you can make these quite easily yourself if you have either one of the Ingra or one of the Klein jigs or almost any of the better quality uh, miter saw, uh, miters for your table saw, you can make this. This one is uh, 16 segments. It's set up uh, 11 and a quarter here, 11 and a quarter here for 22 and a half across here. And to set it up, you simply square up one of the arms with the edge of the saw blade, stick the other one in, like this, squeeze the two arms together, and you will cut, after you adjust it the first time, you will cut repeatedly, ever and ever, the exact right size 16 segments through there, and you never have to measure them, sand them, or anything else again. Now, if you take a look, I'm gonna pass this around, you hear all this sanding that you see, especially in the, in the Ray Allen book and so like this. I've got a sawn edge and a sanded edge using an 80 grit wheel on a Rikon sander with no run out. It's in a, a good one, clean, no glue messed up on it. And this side, the sawn, is off of an eight year old um, 40 tooth combination blade that has never been sharpened. And you don't need to do anything in this joint for it to be perfect, and it's a better joint than the sanded joint. So you'll just pass that around. Now the first time you use this thing, you may or may not get a perfect uh, 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 joint. You'll take, a, you'll take a set of squares like this, and I'll show you this in a second. I've got 16 little segments lined up like this, and, uh, and you put it together, and holy cow, there's a gap. Well, if there's 16 chances for you to make an error, one degree error on each segment is, is uh, uh, 16 degrees total. So there's two really handy things to do. On my 12 segment one, it came in perfect by putting a piece of masking tape on this end. It adjusted a quarter of a, of a degree or whatever out. So it's got one piece of uh, uh, masking tape on it, 
and it works just fine. I can set this jig up, use it up, and cut these without ever worrying about test fitting or uh, sanding them here. A slightly more sophisticated way to do that is if you take a little bit of a notch out of here, kind of just smooth this out a little bit so it's low, then with a hand plane, you can either knock a little off here or a little off here and tune this in. So the first time you use your, your jig, the thing to do is to get a piece of uh, either MDF, a piece of plywood, and I guess it's a nice square piece of wood, using about a two inch uh, uh, segment length, adjust it the first time. And for me, on most of my pieces, uh, this one's for 32, I've got them all the way to 48. Uh, you'll find that uh, um, uh, you can bring it in where it will cut pretty close to perfect joints uh, every time with just minor, minor adjustment. So the way you use this thing, of course, is to uh, slide on your table saw, and your first cut is set up like this, and your second cut is set up like this, and then you move back and you move your next cut like this, and every cat segment comes off. And kind of the magic is if you've misaligned one of the arms by moving back and forth, you automatically correct any errors. So this subtracts out any errors in, uh, in having the jig misset a little bit. If you use the type of jig, I'll show you a little bit on a couple of photos, where you flip the board back and forth each time, the errors do not cancel out. And you can also wind up getting, if your blade is not square, that you can get kind of some warps and wobbles that are hard. So this jig automatically sets up to cut uh, perfectly square jigs by moving just from side to side. Now, a couple of things on that we're going to talk about from the safety aspect in particular. So the segmented turning can be repetitive and sometimes tiring work, and you can lose focus, um, uh, you can become fatigued, and you can run your thumb through your table saw, or worse yet, you hold your piece on your chop saw like this, and you cut a nice thumb at a great angle. So you have to be careful on this sort of stuff. So there's kickbacks and all kinds of things that can occur. And one of the things I would, I'm gonna show you this on our tables in a second, but I always use a zero clearance insert and everything, but I make a little guard so that the piece that falls off flies to this side and does not vibrate over and wind up where it can hit the saw blade. I have had one of those, and uh, uh, literally, because I do stay out of the line, shot a piece over my window through a, over my shoulder, through a uh, four by eight window that was the back side of my table saw, uh, and into the neighbor's yard. And so the idea of how far a, a delta table saw will throw something is quite surprising. And this guard, being a little bit longer than the blade, makes sure that if you're leaving pieces on the table, they cannot vibrate back in and hit that blade and come flying back at you. So very important in my view. Um, okay, so I want to, let's see, I think I've got just about everything I want to do. Oh, one last thing. Now, there's a website, and I'm going to write it down here somewhere, but it's www.segeasy. It's a guy named Jerry Bennett. He's the uh, um, uh, inventor, or the guy that deserves credit for this sled. And he sells these wedgies if you want to, uh, to buy them. Uh, and his website, he's got all kinds of instructions, and he plays a wonderful bluegrass banjo as he explains things. So there's a lot to be said. He's a pretty good guy. Uh, but if you, instead of leaving this set up like this, if you drop this one of these arms down, still put your piece in and align the next one, instead of getting nice square segments, you'll get these rotated, these, uh, these tapered segments like this that also fit real well. And so you're looking like, say, if this is the top of a bowl, you get this, these, uh, these nice angled segments that come around. If these are on the bottom near the base, they make spirals and turns as they come around. So you, by adjusting this, one, you, you, uh, you can get these different shapes. And again, all of the errors and the angles will cancel out. The uh, other thing that's uh, um, uh, kind of nice on that is, uh, uh, let's see, well, whoop, let's see. I'm losing my thought of what I was going to say about that last one. Well, the idea that the errors cancel out was the main piece that I wanted to, uh, to make on that, that you can do that. So I want to jump in, and before I do anything else, yes, yes, please. I was just curious, how thick of a segment can you make? Well, those you saw here were close to two inches, and so I, I make them there. I think the, the your limit would be how high your table saw blade sticks up. But so I normally buy uh, rough saw wood, which is usually 15 16 and I'll typically design a bowl using three quarter inches, and as I smooth out the, uh, the uh, segment rings that I've made them, 
cut them down to three quarters of an inch. But I think you can kind of say safely make segments up to two inches or better if you wanted to. I have done some that are two inches. Yes? So your jig sets your angle properly. Mm -hmm. Are there any shortcuts for getting the length? Oh, <coughs> on how long a board? No, on when you're cutting that. Oh, yeah, yes. What we do here is we always use a stop in the, uh, in the uh, and I was going to show this, I just forgot to. Uh, we'll have one I use some kind of stop on the clamp into the other uh, 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 sliding uh, uh, miter rail, and then just set this, and when you cut your first one, you typically make your first cut, bring this over, and have a small mark as to where you want it, and then set this, slide this over and set it right to where you want it, and then you can just from there you repeat. And I'm glad you uh, you reminded me here. The the big piece there is of course to use a consistent pressure. You don't need any clamps and grips and stuff like this, but if you consistently measure this, put it against the fence with a consistent pressure, you'll always come out and get a, a smooth set of uh, segments that uh, match up with that much trouble. Go ahead. And then you set that upstream to the blade so it's released. Right, we're going, to, we're going to show that right here. Some people will try to put their fence over here, and that is bad because you never uh, um, uh, never want that piece constrained or held. You want it to be able to fall freely off. And, uh, and so I'll never do that. And I'll, we'll show a picture here on the saw in just a second for that. There's one more question, Mick. Yes. What's the gentleman's name on WW, sir? It's uh, Jerry Bennett, B E N N E T T. And it's www.sangeasy. So we're going to wind up then, when we're all said and done with that, we're going to wind up with a little set of segments like this. And we, and we, I'm going to go ahead and discuss gluing for just a second before I uh, switch over and show some, some um, uh, videos. Now, or not videos, but just a couple of quotes. You'll read all kinds of things about gluing these pieces together. I do not have the manual dexterity to manage to put 15 rubber bands around my wrist, hold all this together while glued, and get those rubber bands around it. And I've seen guys do that. I cannot do it. I've seen all kinds of other stories and stuff like this. There's nothing simpler than just using the blue tape upside down, put the segments on it, and that holds the edges here so that the piece doesn't slip in or out, and then just use good old hose clamps with a little driver here to clamp the thing together. And it doesn't take a, you don't have to have a massive amount of glue, but a much more generous amount of glue than you would use if you were doing furniture or something. And always take a look and make sure you can't see light through the rings. And, and if there is, you will have to make some kind of tune up either with sanding, cut a new piece, or, uh, or tune up your rig there. But like I said, this was cut straight off the saw, no adjustments, no nothing, and not a, not a light gap anywhere in there. Now for me, when you make these bigger ones, and I go down to Home Depot, and I'm struggling, I'm trying to get the guy to, I need a, I need a hose clamp that'll go around something 14 inches. And uh, he looked at me for a while and he said, you know, did you think you could just put two together? You know, and I kind of had that stupid look on my face like, well, yeah. You know, so you can buy these like at eight inches and just connect them around. You, know, you, you don't need to go to attempt to buy a 24 inch diameter 39.95 hose clamp. You can just use the small ones and stack them together. So, so I'll do some lack of common sense things like that now and then. Back in the heating department where they saw all the ductwork, they have some. Yeah, they have hot water heaters for, uh, and they, sometimes they have them and sometimes they don't. But they're the ones to hold your hot water tank against the wall when the big ones so, yeah. But, uh, but the small ones actually wind up quite a bit cheaper, and then you can also use, make all kinds of different uh, dimensions for them. So let's see, I think I want to take a quick look at a couple of, of pictures of some of this in action, if I can uh, get the, uh, the computer hooked up. Oh, yeah, I'm going to come on.
Okay, so there's the uh, uh, sled sitting on the table. It's right in one minor groove. The other minor groove's got the stop. You can see it's set up and locked down. And the way the uh, zero clearance insert is set there to make sure that the pieces don't vibrate in over and, and uh, uh, come into it. Um, then here, I'm going to say always when you rip your boards, keep everything organized, and put one kind of mark on the far edge of one piece, and then also down the inside edge. You can't see it here, but you like the pieces marked because later on you're going to need to keep track of where you cut them from the board. So these are laid out. Uh, this is. This entire bowl uh, is going to be set out there after cutting the segments. That's this bowl, and that's a, about, uh, I'm going to say, less than an hour's worth of work to cut those pieces out. And again, none of them require any adjustment except the place where I screwed up and I had to fix them. I'll show you that a little bit later. They're all the same angle? Everyone is the same angle. Oh, uh, what I wanted to say earlier, I have in there all of the segment angle tables. There's one there for six segments all the way up to 48 segments. I would never bother using the 32 and the 48. Instead, I would use like 16. You know, say you're making a big ring with all many colors. Make one ring simply square, or one, one segment simply square, like a quarter inch long, and the next one an inch and a quarter. They add up to be an inch and a half, and the angles match. And using the 24 segments instead of 48 is just less places for errors to come into it. So you can also make a sled like this. Most of you who have a table saw have probably built some kind of a cross-cut sled at one time or another. You can use one of these, you know, use some kind of clamp, a stop block, stop block, cut through here. If you'll notice on the back end of this, there's a little square block there so that you don't push the, uh, the saw blade all the way through it so you can come into it. And there's on the far end, you can't see it here, but there's actually a stop block to keep it from going uh, too far at the same time. Um, and so this piece, the white piece there with the red hand on it, kind of backwards for me, the red is where you're supposed to put your hand and you push it through. Make sure you never get your hand in the line of half of the blade. And on me, I always use a toggle clamp to hold something on a, on a, on a sled like that instead of one of these little clamps that I'll show you here in just a second. And, uh, and then, as we talk about gluing, uh, we're going to glue these rings on. I glued this one on, you see, using this ring arrangement we have right here. If you read, you know, stories and so on, you can make one of these clamps, like a, a bridge or a clamp like this, a press. Uh, you know, it's a, 10, uh, a $20 veneer press and some scrap plywood. Um, I wouldn't recommend that for the beginning guys who just the first couple of these because just a plain old big C clamp or a big F clamp will work just fine to clamp these segments together. And so again, minimize your expense, your outlay, test a few, see if you like it, uh, and so on. And I think that's all I need. Yep, that's all I need to see on these right now. So. Uh, What I was going to say is if you, if you read some of the books on um, um, the segmented turning, especially the guys who are using the um, um, sanders all the time to true up the pieces, it, it, you may want to do that. A lot of tedious work in my view. But if you do, uh, first of all, Kirk Theobald, uh, uh, his book on how to true up and align the sander is the best instructions out there on the market. And those guys use these kind of clamps as a hold down when they're going through their sander and stuff like this to hold the piece down. If you use your cross-cut sled like that and you don't have a toggle clamp, do not use one of these clamps or one of these hold downs on your table saw. If you miss a little bit and you hit the blade on this hardened steel um, um, uh, piece here, it will immediately shatter the carbide blade tip and send it straight into your face. And uh, uh, I have an associate that I used to work with that uh, he didn't do it in that fashion, but he did knock a carbide blade off, wearing safety glasses, but it hit his cheek, went into his eye, and penetrated there. And he explained to me that when that, that goo that's inside your eye leaks out, that it is really painful. And he didn't lose his vision, he was quite lucky. But the carbide teeth, you should never use any kind of a metal hole down that you can slip or twist on like this. So these are great if you're going to be using the sander, but don't. Uh, try to use these as a hold down when you're cutting segments. Okay, so now we've cut a whole bunch of segments. We've uh, come in, we've glued all these things together. I typically will make uh, 
all the segments on you know all the segments one day probably glue them up all one day and for most bowls between say five and uh, eight or nine rings that's probably a two to four hour job maybe a little bit longer if it's the first time you've got to tune up your sweat or something but so let's get rid of this thing and then we'll start into seeing if we can actually turn something here since I think a woodworking demo is more fun if you demo something. We'll, we'll try that as a theory at least. I'm just going to take this off for now. Now, whether you're going to do a a closed vase or vessel where you're going to have to make, either make it in two pieces and glue it together or hollow it, or whether you're going to do an open vessel like one of these, you need to start, the most efficient way is to start with your base piece, to come in and do a, a, a base right off the bat, and if you're going to do it where you glue them together, do the base and your rim as your first activities. For me, I want to always start out, I use these almost exclusively, the little two and a quarter inch aluminum easy wood uh, face plates. You're not turning anything heavy. Uh, everything starts out pretty close to imbalance. And you're not turning anything really fast. So the $25 face plate is really all you need. When I start out with this one, I'm going to uh, have this attached with just two pieces of double back tape, just the old double back sticky tape, not that foam stuff that you see for mounting pictures and so on like this, but the regular masking tape that's simply glued on both sides. I think they sell it here, they sell it through all the catalogs. Uh, if you're ever into uh, industrial size purchases of things, um, and K line or U line is the U line is the name of the, the industrial firm that uh, that sells all stuff. So this thing is just taped on, squeezed in the vise for a second. Now this one I'd actually worked a little bit on before, so uh, this is a second piece, second time around on this thing, but it's going to work out for around. And this is the first time I've used the power mounting blade, so I'm going to be a little bit different. So when you go to cut one of these, on almost every bowl that you will make, the base piece is normally going to have a concave turn instead of a convex turn. If you want to try to come in and turn this, and you you're, have this mounted like you're going to mount it the regular way, this is reverse mounted right now. If you haven't mounted the, the, the uh, other way, you can't cut that turn because there's no room to come around here. So I'm going to turn this, getting my nice outside mounted concave turn, then I'm going to take it, mount it onto my permanent work piece that I'm going to use it for. And, uh, uh, and that way, I'll cut this piece easy, flip it around, and then start gluing the rings to it. So I wasn't clear on that. You nearly always have this kind of a shape on your very base piece. And I'm always going to use, we'll talk brain a little bit more, I'm always going to wind up using a piece of flat sawn wood, or, or basically not in grain wood, it doesn't matter whether it's flat sawn or poor sawn. And when you try to turn this curve like this, instead of one like this, if this is mounted in orientation that you're going to start with, you can't get the tool in here to make this turn. So I'll always come in and you can see it's a little out of balance right now. So I'm going to kind of come in, start here. Now I'm kind of like BB King, I can't uh, sing and play, and play at the same time.
didn't do this now, it's very as close to the center as I have heard. And if you're like me, and you've got uh, uh, one of the live centers with multiple pieces, 
is first of all, all those pieces will fit this exactly. So if you ever want to use this as a center marker for a piece that you forgot to mark the center on, it works really great to put that little cone in there. On this thing, I drop a little piece of plastic or a nut or a bolt or anything that I've got handy down inside there. Because those two pieces of, um, of tape will hold that amazingly well and will come right off of that. So now, just peel off my, you can see those are just two pretty small pieces of tape. They held that, I turned that at uh, about 600 RPM. I just didn't think to speed up. I should have had this about 1,000 or so. But those two pieces of tape will hold that just fine for this activity. And now I've got uh, a uh, two and a half inch easy wood center screwed on in the back with just four screws, uh, a waste block on there glued on. And, uh, and I can now glue, I, uh, I've done this with uh, bowls that are, uh, uh, well, it's close as large as these two we have in the back tonight here. Plenty, it's, you're, you're swinging a weight, it's very light. Uh, it's also in balance when you start, so it's not out. So these things will work just fine to get started. I will put this back on. I will chew it up with either my uh, um, uh, scraper or uh, use the edge of the gouge. And usually I will start whatever I want my base to look like. Like if I want like about a half inch cut in there, I'll take almost all of that wood out of the Leaving a little here, you can kind of see the circle for it to be uh, glued in. So I'll pass this around, and uh, what I say is, uh, again, I didn't do a really super job on this, but I think you can take a look at it and see that you don't need to sand that much, and it's cut almost to the final size to start, start stacking a ring like this on it once those rings are trued up. Okay, so let me pass that around and we're going to take a look at it. And if you would, feel free to try to break it off. Yes? Do you trust that CA glue? What's that? You don't really trust that CA glue? For this, I don't use it for anything on the actual bowl itself. All, everything right. in the bowl is tight bond only. But I've never broken uh, one of those uh, uh, CA joints off like that. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Now, I, I have on some where I've used uh, the three of uh, the. Uh, 35 millimeter spigot jaw. I've broken the spigot off, but I've never had one of those joints come off on it. But if you take that joint and hit it with a mallet, it will pop right off. Um, but, uh, but if you apply steady pressure, it's pretty hard to do. Uh, you also, I only put a thin ring around there, and uh, uh, you can fully glue them if you want to also. I don't know, anybody else have experience with the CA glue? Uh, it took me a long time to decide to trust it, and I think it was uh, David Ellsworth doing a demo on a wet bowl that convinced me that it must be pretty strong. So was that medium or thick? Oh, that, was, that one happened to be thick. 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 Yeah, thick. Thick. So now we've made somewhere in the neighborhood of four to eight or ten even rings. We've glued them together. We uh, checked what they looked like as it. And there's glue all over this side and uh, maybe on this side here. And these things, they, the segments may not have lined up perfectly as you clamped them and so on. So you need to trim those things up. And if you don't have cold jaws, cold jaws, uh, or something similar, uh, this would be pretty difficult if you try to sand these smooth. It's a long and laborious process here. But I've come in and I've done a couple of things that I want to point out. Oh, and uh, one other thing, uh, I'm going to pass this around too. Oftentimes, instead of using the uh, 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 two and a quarter inch or two and a half inch jaws, you have all these Beal wood taps, and you just use some uh, flat grain and make your own pieces. If you can see, this bowl has got one of those on it. It's uh, one of these wooden ones. And for the purpose of a bowl, you can put this on nine or ten times without loosening up the threads. It will come back to the same orientation. It will run true just fine. And so for the price of a, of a Beal tap, which is about $25 or, or maybe a little bit more, you can make just hundreds of these things. Uh, you get a two-inch uh, two thick offcut at Sears Cross or maybe here. You can make uh, 10 or 12 of them in an afternoon glue the uh, CA glue straight to this and then either turn the whole thing away or just part it off either way you want to and then use it again another time or two. So these are pretty handy and they are certainly cheap. I mean, there's probably not a dollar in this thing is, uh, as far as the amount of wood in it. And uh, 
as we'll see when I turn this one, they uh, seem to be plenty stable and, uh, uh, and, and don't, you know, if you put something in and out of the chuck each time, you use a four-jaw chuck, each time it never runs quite true as it did last time. Okay, this will run true every time. So just pass these around. Like I said, I make these by the batch and use them. I'm going to take my coal jaws, and there's two things I wanted to point out here. And then, I think this is the third thing I've dropped, so I hope not the blue one comes through. Here, I've taken my set of coal jaws, and they do not run true. This is a set from uh, Nova, and they have all kinds of run out to them, and I, they came out of the box that way. For most things, like if you're reverse mounting a bowl, and you're going to just chew the end piece off of it, it doesn't matter because you're only working in the center, no big deal. Uh, uh, but as the things get wider and wider, these things bounce around on you quite a bit. So I do two things. Is sometimes I put a big plexiglass plate behind here, screw it in from the back once it's adjusted, and that holds everything flat and true. Uh, and there are bigger rings, especially if you're at the outside edge, that's uh, sometimes necessary in the cold zones. But what I've done, which seems kind of counterintuitive, is use these hex head screws that are the flat head screws with a fairly sharp edge. And because you're, you're turning away the wood that you're clamping right now, this clamps twice as good as um, the little rubber or uh, phenolic blocks that you buy with the, uh, uh, that come with the, the, the uh, uh, jaws. Uh, they also hold it true so that it doesn't back and bounce around back and forth. And this outside edge is something that's going to be cut away anyway. Now, just like if you stick your hand onto a cold jaws when it's spinning, those rubber bumpers hurt pretty bad. These would cut and damage you, so you want to be very, very careful. But this holds much, much better for a piece like that. The other thing that's an advantage is when you're trying to make some of these feature rings that are kind of, uh, you know, pretty that you come in here, you're using wood down to a quarter of an inch or maybe even three sixteenths, you can screw these further in and clamp a ring made out of wood as thin as this. So you can clamp without distortion a real thin piece of wood if you use these kind of screws. The ones I have in here now are actually the um, uh, extra set of screws that come with one of the uh, uh, Nova jet chucks. And so they're just in there, nice sharp edge to them, and they will clamp this just as good as can be. This is usually just perfectly fine to kind of hold this. It's good to sort of just to get it lined up pretty close to uh, centered on a couple of the blocks so that you've got kind of a decent even space in there. And just clamp this in. When you're making bigger bowls, I have clamped these from the inside in the expanding mold, like when I made, made this mold. You do want to be careful that the glue is dry a bit from that and it's pretty strong. You, you could probably break it apart, but again, with using this type of fixture, these dig in a little bit. It doesn't take much uh, holding power to do that, and they will not come off of the, uh, the cold jaws for you. That's his famous last words. Now you'll notice in the entire, all, all we're only brought three tools tonight and nothing to sharpen them with. So this is either a sign of confidence or foolishness. But uh, for instance, uh, this was the only gouge, I, or bowl, bowl gouge I owned when I made this bowl. So this bowl was made entirely with just this gouge. And most of this wood, you're cutting right along the grain and you always get nice spirals coming off. And the turning is easy. It's not, uh, not anywhere near as difficult as that. But when you first start to turn these things, you can get a lot of bounce. Uh, it, the, the, the thing can be out of alignment, um, your cold jaws can be like mine and not real well. And so you want to come in and get one, one side flattened off pretty nice so that you can glue it up. So this is just an old scrap piece that I had laying around from the bowl and I'm not sure why I didn't wind up using it, but I didn't. And so we'll come in, normally I will we'll do these about uh, Somewhere between 5 and 600 uh, RPM. I think 600 is the max recommended on the lathe here. And I look at this one, and it's actually running pretty smooth. If it were not running smooth, you can either, with a pole cut like this, come through and take off the first piece, especially if there's glue spots on it, things like this, or even a push cut. Either one will do just fine. So let's just come in and just take a little bit off there. And you can kind of see that bouncing because the segments are not even. If you try to scrape right away, 
that would uh, um, balance log you. You can also come in from the outside. surface across here. Now I've got a little bit of a dip in this one right now and I probably should knock the edge off if I was actually going to use this piece. Get it as flat as you can, don't see any gaps, and then sand it one time. Just, uh, just a few turns, not much on there, but just uh, you know, put it about uh, 100, 200 RPM, spin it a little bit, and it'll be perfectly flat. Now, you want to resist the temptation to flip this ring over and, uh, and do the other side at the same time. If you do that, no matter how careful you think you're being, the two sides will not be parallel. And so when you try it, you'll, you'll be off a little bit, no matter how hard you seem to work at it, at least for a guy like me. And that, unless you've got one of these uh, performance sanders that are on the belt drive that you run through the belt drive, I think $1,500 and on a dream list which will never be fulfilled. But, uh, but if you get these things off and you start trying to stack up multiple pieces, they will slip and slide on you. Because you've got now you've got two pieces that are angled, and it's like trying to glue a miter joint with a straight clamp. It'll pull up and slide on you. So you are forced to come in. The most time time saving thing is to do one side, glue it up like this, and then go ahead, uh, true this surface after it's glued to the bowl, glue the next ring on if you've done this for. So kind of your sequence of steps here is to come in, make your two end pieces, either just your base or your base and your rim. True those surfaces, have all of your rings with one side trued up, glue one on, clamp it down somewhere, take it off, do the top piece of the other one, glue it off. By that time, you can turn the next piece to level it, clamp the next ring on, and just back and forth. And if you assume that if you're making a bowl like this one, or say a tall base, I don't have one with me, but one of the taller bases, you might have seven rings. Well, you're about 15 minutes on this one, 15 minutes on the top, 15 minutes here, 15 minutes there, and about, about 30 minutes between gluings before you come back to the lathe, and you will have plenty of glue strength to go ahead and, uh, and, and uh, glue that up. Now, I, I think you and I have talked that uh, we're surprised how people think they've got to let these glue joints sit two, three hours, be clamped the whole time, and so on. But for type 1 glue, clamping for about 15 minutes, it has about 90% of its working strength in 30 minutes. And so, so you can unclamp them and turn them fairly quickly. And I think yours like me, pretty good success, right? Yeah, I've had good success with that. Yeah. I used to type one for you know, three, four hours. Yeah. I learned about shorter. I never had one. So I'll pass this around. Again, this was straight off the saw. You can see about, uh, about the level of uh, finish on here, perfectly good. This one's not quite as flat as it should be, but it's perfectly good for that. And if you do, by the way, leave like a little dip or a little flat spot right in here, somewhere a little bit slow, that's exactly where the finished surface will show up. You know, so, so, so get, them, you know, get these flat because that won't, that won't work out well for you. Okay, so. We've been just about an hour or so. Not, actually, not even quite an hour. And we're going to see if, uh, if we can turn that without it flying into the audience. 
It's okay. Our, our insurance is paid up. Okay. Okay. Actually, I'm, I'm being a little facetious. I have great confidence, but we will take a, a couple of safety precautions uh, just in case. So I've got this, and you can see, uh, let me talk about this. Here, I've glued on one of these blocks. This is just glued on with the CA glue around here. Glue it on. I've had it on and off the lathe to make the bottom, to glue the veneer on, to glue each one of these rings on, and now glue this, and it still will run true when we come back to it. You can kind of see a couple of design features on this thing. The base is Peruvian walnut, so it's a little darker than regular walnut, and I, I find that a darker base is always nice. I'm going to, and to come back when we talk grain here in a little bit, I'm going to tell you that I always use a solid piece of wood instead of segmenting the base. Now you can do the segmented base if you want for the look, the appearance of it, but for strength and, and durability, you do not need to do that. I, I was telling someone, I, I believe I've made somewhere between 30 and 40 bowls of, of, of this type uh, over the course of the last four years, and I've not had a single separation after they were done. So nothing's ever come apart on me, uh, or uh, it's, you know, your, your niece calls you up and says, you know, Uncle, the bowl you made me came apart. You know, there's all the really good here. So you got a nice little, then there's a little red and black veneer ring right here. And it's always when you change wood species, a little piece of veneer always seems to really kind of pick it up a little bit. And so the dyed veneers that you can buy, or use white ones, you know, a piece of maple, glue it on a quarter inch thick, turn it, just cut off all the waste until it's about a sixteenth or less thick here. And then here, rather than get fancy with the design like a big fancy feature ring, we're just going to have a yellow heart rim to it. So you have a nice walnut bowl, have a nice, you can kind of pick up the red ring of the veneer, it'll get wider when we uh, open it up, and a nice yellow rim to it, which hopefully will complement the uh, um, walnut. So, Now, had I used my coal jaws while this piece was still in it and glued it together, this ring would be perfectly true using uh, this behind the coal jaws to bring it in. Because I used the homemade coal center, this is probably going to be off. And I'm going to guess maybe a sixteenth of an inch or so. Because we're here in a crowd, I'm going to give it a test run. I don't normally do this at home, but I'm going to come in. Cone center is not quite touching. You could actually make it touch if you wanted to. But it's not a bad idea to come in, kind of see if it's in balance or out of balance, something like this, and also make sure it sticks in. And when I do my first cut on here, 700, I'm going to be a little slower for that. Do my first cut on this here. I'm going to leave that ring on just for a, or my uh, plate here, just for a little bit of a safety factor because there's people sitting in the front row. Again, I wouldn't normally do this at, at home. Mine turns out that these are really easy to turn. You can see the nice little curls. Even though that was an uh, uh, inch and a half long pieces of wood, you still get nice shavings that are glued together. Everything comes off, and you're cutting the same all the way around. So you're not going end grain, side grain, end grain, side grain. So it cuts really easy. In general, you can take this. I always take these edges off first, knock the outside off. Then come in and clean off the inside, get them kind of close, then true up the top as if I'm going to glue another ring on. And it uh, uh, just helps keep the bouncing around a little bit. So, uh, so you can, if you want to, you can come in and cut actually at this angle to take that off. But that gives you a fairly rough cut. And as you see in these edges here, especially when this leading edge right here comes into the chisel, you can get torn grain. But if you use kind of the traditional uh, push cut coming along like this, whether you cut in, or whether you turn and cut out, either way will cut equally well. So you don't, you know, normally a bowl of this shape would be mounted the other way and you would cut the outside coming down this way. You don't have to on this. Now I will sometimes turn left-handed, sometimes turn right-handed. It's literally every piece will be a little different for me as far as how I wind up approaching it. And now I don't have a super tight fit on this thing, so I'm probably going to turn, take that off after we make a couple of cuts just to make sure we're in balance here. So I'm going to bring this up to about, oh, I might come a little over 600 or so. I'm going to knock those edges off first. And 
the people who are off like that, you can, you, can, you can hear the banging as you come through. They come this way. They don't cut just about the same. Like they do. for a second that I was going to glue more rings on this. I've come in on each one of these rings and uh, left my glue line right there on each one. And those kind of serve as guidelines. I know that each one of those joints is about a quarter of an inch bigger than it needs to be. So I've got all that room to turn off the excess of the bowl. Now if we were gluing another ring, what we would do rough edges on the inside when you're turning, they become, the deeper the vessel gets or the bowl gets, the more difficult they become to kind of work with. And if you'll remember, this glue joint on this base piece of wood, which we've not touched, was almost an inch and a quarter, inch and a half thick. I have lots of glue in here. So I'm going to take that off, and there's a lot of balance when that happens. But once that's cut off, and the rest of the inside of the bowl is nice and smooth, and it makes it for very easy turning when you go to finish off the inside. So you'll take off the extra on the inside, and then you're going to come through and flatten the top as if you were ready to uh, glue another ring on. And then we're going to try to work the outside just a little bit. So I'm going to take this off, but before I do, I want to point out, I'm going to come back and talk about it later, but you'll notice I've flipped my pieces so that I've got inside outside as we go around here, and I've alternated the, the way the brain is set up on these things. So let's go ahead and go back. So when, just, I, when I glued this one, I rushed a little bit. It's not quite as centered as I would have wished. Too, too close on that. So you want to kind of knock that down at the same time. And again, you're just kind of blending the curve. You've got a lot of wood. You've got a half inch on the diameter that you can, you can play with to take off. So I'm going to come, I'm going to come in. Okay. Then we're Again, all I'm going to do is making sure I don't get a catch when I come into that.
So now I've got a completely smooth inside piece coming in through here. You can see the, uh, the yellow heart tends to do crumbles, but you get nice kind of gorilla hair off the walnut here. These are fairly smooth. I'm going to take them just a little bit more off there. But as I do that, I'm going to show you two things on here. But first, I'm just going to well, actually one thing. Let me come in here. So I want that for my later turning just to be a little bit smoother right in here. Now then, what would probably be a disaster on a full wood blank is you can come in and scrape that. You do it all the side blank. And if you have two marks or regulation, anything you don't want, you can get the, you know, the perfectly good shear scraping cut on there and not worry about a catch. I mean, you, you know, this is probably if you take a look here, this could go with 220 right off the bat for sanding in there. So the ability to use your shear scraping like a technique, to use a regular scraper, you just do that that quick. Because I'm not sure we'll get back to the rest of the bowl or not, or to the inside of the bowl or not. We come in here, and then making sure you're holding your tool nice and level. And you'd likely be set up for disaster if you tried to do that on a regular uh, uh, full, full grain wood that was a, a full regular bowl blank. So, this is a little bigger than I wanted for my rim, so I'm going to try to trim it down a little bit. keep my glue lines out here to serve as guides, and then flatten off the top. Now, if you, uh, I usually go ahead and measure for 3 quarters of an inch, this looks about right here, because if you use 15 16 wood and you just trim it up, it probably wound up at 7 eighths. If you've got 8 rings, your bowl is now an inch taller than you thought. You know, doesn't matter. I get to this stage, and typically, I simply just decide what looks good. You know, I had this shape that I drew and everything, but look, to see if it uh, that turns out. Now I'm going to turn for a little bit here on the outside to just kind of talk through some of the, of the pieces of it. I may or may not uh, take it all the way down to a smooth outside. I'm going to try to, but I tend to be a slow turner. Uh, so I've only been turning about four years. Um, I have difficulty capturing a smooth curve on the first try. So instead of those these guys turn the, you know, and they turn the bowl in five minutes, you know, I'm about two or three hours tinkering around here trying to get that right. The nice piece with this is that if you get like one place where there's a little nasty dip or a tool mark, yeah, outside you can use the scraper just great on it. You know, it doesn't, I mean, it just works just fine. But again, you'll be turning, you'll be spinning off nice curls here because you're always cutting side down. So I come in, I've made my piece here. I've tried to get it just almost exactly perfect. I'm just a little fat. So I'm going to start working these rings down just a little bit and try to get a smooth curve going around here. And since we want to talk about grain for just a little bit, I'm probably only going to do uh, just a little bit on this to kind of show that turns, and then we're going to stop and talk grain orientation a little bit. So we come over here, and I'll start down at the bottom of the And I will typically turn a bowl of this shape like this.
Now, uh, I'm going to leave this out here and look at it. You could, there's some ripples in here, so it's not quite smooth enough yet, but it's close enough on uh, smoothness. There's no torn grain anywhere. You would be able to uh, uh, get on that with some pretty small sandpaper. Now, I'm going to kind of come up in here and kind of come back in the other direction uh, just to show you that you can. And uh, so this next frame, once again, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to do this so around 600 or so here. So I'm going to come in. satisfied with my shape and then use all my interior turning in order to bring it to the final dimension that I want. And so, uh, um, I'm a, as I said, I'm a little bit of a slow turner, not a slow learner necessarily, but a slow turner. And so I uh, couldn't quite get that done as fast as I wanted and uh, even though you try to time this at home, you don't quite get that. You're done with this. And again, pull this off. Now for me on walnut, I will mention one thing. Uh, and we're going to I'm going to get us done here by uh, 8.30. Uh, on the walnut, I've been using two coats of spar varnish, you know, because you can't use filler because of the various colors here. So you use two coats of spar varnish where you sand them completely off in between, and then go to like the Minwax wiping varnish, and you get a really smooth, smooth finish out of it. So that does that. And, uh, so let me, I'm going to, I'm going to cover a couple of things on, in, on brain matching because it's uh, Actually, one of the more important things that uh, I think I've learned for myself. But all of all 
of my basis, I said I'm going to, I'm going to take credit for about 30 or 40 of these balls, and I've not had a failure at the base joint, uh, this piece right here. And, and so I think that's pretty good. Now, I've done some stave construction where you have the long ones. They all failed initially, and I've learned you had to use a tinian or some type of socket to open that. But here, I strictly use uh, the flat sawn wood. And what I do is I try to orient the grain like this, where you've got to kind of bark up. And if you do bark up, and you cut out the inside of this bowl, then, then you have cut all the long fibers. And so the vein does no, it will no longer bend and flex. It will stay flat on you. Even though you cut it and take a little bit out of here, then the only wood that's really left is right in the middle, and that thing is dimensionally stable and won't walk, lock, and twist and work on it. At the same time, the bowl walls are thin enough that they will flex a little bit if it does happen. So with just gluing this straight on without any kind of a tenon or anything else, which takes a long time to fit up and get correct, these seem to hold up just fine for me. I'm going to flip another video on in a moment or two, but on my segments, I've learned that if I make a ball, this is out of uh, ash, and had I made this out of ash, I'm going to show you a picture of it, if I didn't pay attention to the grain orientation, this thing would be a mess. The, there's holes on some pieces, two pieces match, another piece doesn't match, they're just hardball all over the line, and it turns out they're distracting. So as I look at the first beginning, I was thinking of all the bowls I would see on the internet and so on like this. Some were ugly, and some I really liked. I turned out, what is it I like about that? And it's when you get this kind of smooth effect of an orderly progression around here. And you still have these kind of curves and scallops and stuff, but it's not like there's a ring here and one up in different angles and stuff like this. Worst bowl I ever made is out of zebra wood. You cannot, you cannot see the make one of those. So lining up this grain so that you get an even pattern all the way around requires about uh, uh, three quick things. The first one is when you cut your boards, you rip them to length, mark one edge and one side, and, um, uh, and that allows you then when you cut them on the sled is to alternate every other one. Keep them in order and then flip them over so that you have, if uh, I didn't show it on one of those boards I forgot to, but one line will be up, the other one will be on the back side. And then, right over here, if you come in like, and if you come like this, and if you, or so let's say, let's say our curve is coming across the top like this. If your curve is going like this, and these grain lines like this, they will produce whorls, or kind of ovals, or kind of rounded shapes like this, but they will never fall correctly where the joints are. So some of them will be whole, some of them will be half, some of them will be on the wrong side of the board, if you will, the way you look at it. And they're distracting, they don't match. But if you cut this board like this, then every one of those is a line. And this thing comes out to be a series of lines instead of all these mismatched shapes on here. Same thing on the top, you can see on this one, I'm going to show you a couple of videos where I didn't do so well, is here, on this one, nice even lines coming right here, instead of one place you've got a whorl or an oval, a half of an oval, the other oval is on the other two sides, and they come around and they're distracting to the eye. And when you look at this, you, at least I think, capture a feeling that this looks like it's finely made, whereas when all the little pieces are scattered and random, it looks like it was kind of plugged together. So mark your boards, and then figure out which side needs to be up, and mark that side. Now the handy way to figure out which side is up, when you get to look at these things, it can get confusing, I just lay my finger across it. And if I get lines like this one, this side's got to be the top. So I'll write top on here, and all the long lines go on top, and all this uh, on the shorter pieces, they would go on the inside. I don't have the mark here, it'd be like one would be up and the other one would be down. So I'll have all the top lines going on the outside, and on the inside, I'll have all those. And then you need to remember which one's supposed to be the top. Because if you cut it the other way, like this, you put your finger here. You'll see every one of those lines is going to give you a little bit of a rounded shape as you come around. And it, it makes a substantial difference in the final look of your bowl. So if we can flip up the video one more time, I'll try to show you that. And we will have finished two minutes before one and told me it was the first one. I'm just teasing. If we can stick this on, I'll show you a couple of examples here.
Okay, so here is this bowl, and look at that one ring right in the center, that one top right there. See that the, the whorl is cut off on one end, the other half is whole, and it looks way out of place. Well, I miscut a ring, put a new piece in, and got it wrong, and that's what it looked like. So I actually cut that ring out and, and replaced it. And uh, that is probably not worth the eight or 10 hours that it took me to do it. But, but I wanted to, you know, I, I brain matched all of these so well that I was insistent to do it. But it can be really distracting at the look to have half your pieces that way and have all the lines. Um, similar here, here's another bowl kind of like this cherry one we had here. And the cherry one, like I said, gosh, nice, even smooth grain, looks like a piece of nice fine furniture. But on this one, you can see there's a whorl in one, and but it's cut off in the other. The other one's got three quarters of a whorl on it. And now I thought I saw that problem because I alternated. You see, one's whorl, one's lines, one's whorl, one's line. Still didn't look very good. So by flipping over that piece that has the whorl on it, it gave me all lines across the top of the next one I did. And I think make the makes the bowl look a substantially nice and bold, and then at the same time is not any more difficult or more expensive, just in keeping track of the pieces at all. And I think that's all we can do on that. Well, we finished on time, we got through it all, and nobody was injured.